thank you. And thank you all for um, attending my talk, particularly those who are attending at a very early hour of the morning, very late hour of the evening. Today I'm going to talk about two topics, a cross-validation strategy for species occurrence data and a visualization technique to aid in the interpretation of complex models. I'll talk about these topics in the context of species distribution modeling of redwood ants. I must apologize that there are a couple of other topics I mentioned in the abstract for this talk which just won't fit into a 12-minute talk. I'd be very happy to discuss these later via Slack. So very generally, cross-validation is the procedure by which we identify subsets of the data that are both representative of a full data set and independent from all other subsets. Then we use a selection of the subsets to fit a model and predict from this model the subsets of data that we left out from the fitting process. Then by repeating steps one and two many times, leaving out many different subsets of the data from the fitting process, we're able to estimate the generality of our model. This is useful in, in and of itself and also allows us to estimate um, optimal values for our tuning parameters. Species occurrence data such as these um, pose multiple challenges to partitioning our data in a way such that the subsets are good representations of the full data set and the subsets are also independent of one another. These challenges include a class imbalance in our response variable. Um, if you look at the, the graph, you can see that the presences are represented as uh, black triangles, whereas the absences of our um, focal group of species are represented as gray circles. So we can see there's um, actually quite a large class imbalance here. Only about 5% of the observations are presences. There's also spatial dependence in our response variable and spatial heterogeneity, both in the density of presences and absences and in the environmental conditions. So my approach to partitioning these data for cross-validation is strongly inspired by the paper I've cited down the bottom here, this being the Roberts et al. paper from 2017. So my approach has been to partition data from each of the biogeographic regions separately thereby aiming for partitions that contain approximately 10% of the data from each parent region at a ratio of presences to absences similar to that of the parent region, while also in enforcing spatial exclusion buffers around each partition. I am then able to create um, the holdout sets by selecting one of the partitions from each of the biogeographic regions. The validation sets can then be created by selecting one of the remaining partitions from each of the biogeographic regions. And our training set then is the remainder of the observations minus any observations intersecting spatial exclusion buffers around the partitions of the training and holdout sets, of the validation and holdout sets. So running this process um, gives us a result such as this. Here's an example. So we can see here the Six major biogeographic regions of Switzerland have been partitioned, and the so the observations represented as colored points are observations within particular partitions, whereas the observations represented as light gray points are the observations that intersected spatial exclusion buffers around the different partitions of the biogeographic regions. Now, um, what I'm going to show you is how we can select uh, one partition from each of the biogeographic regions to make a holdout set, then go on and select another biogeographic, another partition from each of the biogeographic regions to create our validation set, and then how we get the training set as the remainder. So we can see here our holdout set observations are represented in, in this red color, and our validation set observations are represented in green, with our training set observations represented in purple and the requisite spatial exclusion buffers around holdout set and validation set observations represented as the light gray points. For a particular holdout set, we can, of course, um, partition the remaining data in multiple different ways into training and validation sets, as we can see in the following slides. 
And then, of course, finally, we can select multiple different holdout sets and repeat this process. So for each holdout set, we can have multiple different training and validation sets. The results of performing this process are um, training validation and holdout sets that contain a ratio of presences to absences similar to that in the full data set. And training validation and holdout sets that also contain subsets of the data that are representative of each of the biogeographic regions of Switzerland in approximately the proportions present in the full data set. These um, divisions of the data are also separated by distances greater than the maximum range of spatial dependence de detected among the response observations. I am creating the individual partitions of the biogeographic regions through an iterative growth procedure, whereby the selection of points is grown in an iterative manner such that the ratio of presences to absences within the selection is um, continually um, maintained to be as close as possible to a target ratio, that being the, the ratio of presences to absences in the parent region. And that we run this process until we achieve a number of observations within the selection uh, approximately equal to our target number of observations. In this situation, I'm aiming for approximately 10% of the observations from the parent region. So this brings us on to the second and final component of my talk, which is uh, a visualization technique for the interpretation of complex models. Um, individual conditional expectation plots were proposed by Goldstein et al. in 2015. And what we're looking at here is a uh, plot depicting the actions of one explanatory variable in a random forest. So our explanatory variable is on the horizontal axis. This variable represents shading by the terrain as estimated from a digital elevation model. And the centered predicted probability of ant mound occurrence is on the vertical axis. So if you've seen partial dependence plots before, you're probably wondering what all the different lines are on this plot. So the clue is in the conditional expectation part of the name of these plots. Essentially, what we're seeing here is we're seeing one line on this plot for each observation in the data set. The line is created, of course, by varying our explanatory variable of interest on the horizontal axis and predicting from the random forest to get our um, predicted probability. The reason we have all these different lines is while we're doing this process, we hold all of the other explanatory variables constant at the values they took at one of the observations in our data set. So in this way, we get one line for each observation in the data set. Now, if we look at the traces on this plot, um, I can see the suggestion that there might be two groups of curves. So looking through the other explanatory variables that were assigned high um, conditional variable importance scores, I was able to find that we can actually separate out these groups using the values of another important explanatory variable, this being a composite variable that describes um, elevation and temperature. So what we're seeing in this plot, I think, is good evidence of an interaction between these explanatory variables. So on the horizontal axis, we have shading by the terrain. As we move from left to right along the horizontal axis, we are seeing a description of terrain becoming more shady. So in a way, perhaps we're down in the bottom of valleys rather than at the top of ridge lines. And the, the faceting, the division of the plots into two panels is on the basis of a threshold in the other explanatory variable, which is describing elevation and temperature. So the right-hand plot is describing observations where uh, we were at higher elevations and temperatures were typically cooler. And at these plots, we can see a much more dramatic decrease in the predicted probability of ant mound occurrence as shading by the terrain increases compared to in the left panel, where we are at lower elevations, where it's typically warmer, but we still see a predicted decrease in probability of ant mound occurrence with increased shading by terrain but at a far less, um, far less of a magnitude than we see in the rightmost panel.
So I'll quickly display the key R packages I used for these parts of the project. And then thank you all for your attention and hopefully we have time for one or two questions.